So now let's move on to talk a little bit more about the risk of rejection. As I mentioned earlier, it depends on multiple factors. And you can see here on the spectrum there, depending on the organ transplant that you have, there may be a higher risk of rejections compared to lower risk of rejection. So here on the left side, you can see some organs such as the intestine, the lungs or the heart that may have some exposure to the external environment. And because of that reason, they are typically at higher risk of rejection compared to kidney or pancreas or liver. So depending on this risk of rejection, as well as the patient's specific risk, the team will decide whether you may need more or less immunosuppression from that standpoint. The use of potent immunosuppression agents after solid organ transplant has significantly reduced incidence of rejections, and overall, the risk of rejection also decreased over time. For now, all patients will stay on anti-rejection medication for lifelong to prevent the risk of rejection. And there are some certain cases, very special cases, that patients may trial off medication in exceptional case. But this only under clinical trial or maybe very close directed by the transplant team. But again, this is very extremely high risk and make sure to always follow taking medication as instructed by your transplant team. So how does rejection present us? Sometimes you can see here it can be asymptomatic, so the patient may not feel anything differently at all. And this is basically the reason why the transplant team may need to do more frequent lab tests to make sure that we detect rejection early and treat it early as possible. Sometimes patients may also present with general discomfort, flu-like symptoms, or ill feeling. In severe case of rejection, or if it's left untreated, then sometimes organ functions may also start to decrease, and how it presents may depend on the transplant of organs. For example, patients who reject a kidney may have less urine output. In liver transplant patients, we may see yellow coloring of the skin or eyes, or easier to bruise or bleed. Pancreas transplant patients, when undergo a rejection episode, may see high blood sugar. And in heart and lung transplant patients, we may see symptoms similar to heart failure, such as shortness of breath or decreased ability to exercise. Again, these symptoms can progress and become more severe if left untreated. So please talk to your transplant team as soon as possible if you're feeling unwell or if you're experiencing any type of the symptoms. So how will you um, test to detect this early? For rejection, sometimes the transplant team will do physical exam, meaning that we will examine the area over and around the transplanted organ. When rejection is suspected, we may do routine or specialized blood tests to help assess how well your organs are currently functioning. In some cases, we may also do some other um, tests to rule out other reasons that you may not feel well beside rejection. For example, you may do some imaging such as ultrasound or x-rays, and you can see I listed here on the side some organ-specific tests. For example, an ERCP in liver transplantation may help us detect to see if there's any obstruction in the bio tract. We can do some uh, imaging of the heart by electrocardiogram or an echo, and for lung transplant transplant patient will also perform pulmonary function tests. However, beside all of these tests, a biopsy is required to confirm rejection. Biopsy basically means a medical test involving the removal of tissues or cells in the body, and we will test to see if there's any signs of damage or any signs of disease. So again, a biopsy of transplanted organ can confirm whether rejection is ongoing or not. In, uh, when we start a treatment, we may have to do repeat biopsy to monitor for resolution or disease progression. And in certain cases, for example, heart transplant patient, we may perform routine biopsy as well, um, since this is a good way for us to detect rejection early before symptoms develop. And each center may have different protocol to see how often or how frequently that we have to do biopsy. So now let's move on to talk about different types of rejection. There are several kinds of rejection and they can be a common and lifelong issue. The first one that I wanna talk about is acute rejection. Going by its name, acute may occur weeks to months after transplant. We see it more commonly early on um, after transplant, but that can happen again anytime, even years after transplant, especially if patients not adhere to their medication. 
there's two different types of acute rejection. The first one is acute cellular rejection. And in this case, more common, the T cells, which is a part of your immune system, start attacking your new organ. The other type of acute rejection is called antibody mediated rejection or AMR. This is less common about, compared to cellular rejection, but in this case, your body would develop some donor specific antibodies that may attack your new organ. And compared to the other type, antibody mediated rejection is harder to treat. However, I do want to point out that when treated, acute rejection is reversible in most cases. The risk may decrease over time, but sometimes even if you do everything right, the risk may still be there. And we will try to catch it early and to treat it as soon as possible. The other type of rejection is chronic rejection. And this maybe depends on multiple factors, but not well understood. Going from its name, chronic rejections may occur months to years after transplant. This uh, happened when the body's constant immune response against a new organ slowly damaged the transplanted tissue or organ. And because of that, the chronic rejection is more difficult to treat and sometimes may not respond well to therapy. So the goal in this case is to slow progressions of chronic rejection. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes this happened, um, the type of injury develop over a very long period of time, and sometimes it may cause irreversible damage. So um, patients may need retransplant in chronic rejection. There's different names for each organ. You can see here, for example, in heart transplant patients, we more commonly known as cardiac allograft vasculopathy or CAV, or in lung transplant patients, another name for chronic rejections is uh, BOS or bronchiolitis obliterin syndrome. So now that we know a little bit more about rejection and different type of rejections, what are the goals for treatment in this case? First of all, we hope to suppress your immune system response to um, slow the progressions of rejection and treat it or reverse that. And by doing so, we will also hope to um, restore your ongoing functions and make sure that the transplanted organs start working properly again. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes with rejection, you may experience some signs and symptoms associated with it. So we will also hope that after treatment of rejection, we'll be able to resolve any rejection related symptoms. The dosage and choices of medications for um, treatment of rejection depends on type and severity of the rejection episode. And you can see here also um, a spectrum for mild to severe cases. For mild rejection, patients may be treated outpatients with oral medication, but it is also not uncommon for patients to be admitted in the hospital for IV medications, even with my case. However, for severe case of rejection, we will have to um, admit you to the hospital so that we can monitor very closely uh, for disease progression as well as some uh, other risks and give you stronger IV medication in that case. So now I do wanna talk about some myths and trying to break some myths about rejection. Sometimes I hear a lot that rejection means that you will need a new a whole new other organ, and this necessary a case true. Rejection is a very scary word, but having just one episode of rejection does not mean that you will lose your new organ. As I mentioned earlier, most cases of acute rejection are reversible, and we will talk more about the treatment of rejection later on in the discussion. Another news that I also heard about is, I have rejection because I did something wrong. But this organ will not always be the case. Sometimes rejection may happen, as I mentioned earlier, the risk depends on a lot of factors and everyone may require different amount um, of rejection of immunosuppression. So rejection may be a signal to us that you require a little bit more than what we are giving you. So again, it's a balance and we want to have you just enough of immunosuppression or anti-rejection medication, but giving you too much of that may also cause other issues like infection. So from this standpoint, I do want to point out that taking medication exactly as instructed by your transplant team really helped decrease the risk of rejection, but the risk never turned out to zero, even um, after a long period of time. Lastly, um, some patients may be worried that taking medication will completely shut down their immune systems. And 
Transplant medications, yes, suppress your immune system so that we can prevent rejection or treat an episode of rejection. However, there's might to strong medications that may suppress your immune system to different level. And we will try to have an individualized regimen for each patient. Your body will still have the ability to fight off infection as needed. And we will also give you some anti-infection medications, maybe started after a strong uh, anti-rejection treatment to help your body prevent infection. Usually this will be short-term and similar to what you receive after initial transplant. All right, so now that we went through the background about rejection and different type, let's go into more detail about anti-rejection medications, also known as immunosuppressions. I do want to note that everyone is different and there's several medications that can be used after transplant. Different centers may also have different approach even with the same medications. So please talk to your own transplant team if you have questions about why you're on certain doses or certain medication. And throughout this presentation today, we will go only through the most common medication, but feel free to stop me and ask questions about others. So let's first focus on rejection treatment. This is a medication that can be used short term for high intensity in the setting of rejection. The first medication that I want to talk about is steroids. Uh, it's available as methamprednisone IV version and is also available as oral prednisone. This is the first like medication for all type of rejection from mild to severe case. And treatment typically include high dose corticosteroids followed by a taper. We can do either two to three dose of high steroids IV therapy. This is the most common type. And in this case, we'll have to admit you to the hospital and treat inpatient. In some mild case, um, and when the team uh, just scheme that is necessary, we can treat our patients with high dose oral prednisone. There's some side effects of steroids that I do want to point out, especially with the higher dose and acute phase. So for steroids, it can cause mood swings or irritability. You may also experience some hallucinations, confusions, or insomnia. So we try to give this medication in the morning if possible, if it's just once daily. And also for high dose steroids, we may see high blood sugar. So we will monitor very closely and add medications to make sure that you have a good plus sugar range. The next medication that can be used is called rabbit antithymocyte globulin, also known as the brand name thymoglobulin or thymo for short. This is an IV medication, so a stronger or more potent medication compared to steroids that I just talked about. This can be used for moderate to severe rejections and can be used when steroids is not effective or not enough. For thymoglobulin, this actually requires hospital admissions and close monitoring due to the risk of severe infusion-related side effects when you may see some symptoms such as fever, itching, rash, flushing, or some change in your vital size. So this is the reason why we'll have to admit, admit you to the hospital for close monitoring. This was, um, there's some med free medications that can be given for thymoglobulin and other side effects also include muscle pain or low blood count. So the team will monitor you very closely to make sure that it's safe for this um, medication. The next treatment options for rejection is plasmapheresis. So unlike the medication that we talk about, this is a therapeutic plasma exchange or TPE, a physical therapy, a physical um, removal of bad antibodies. So it's a non-surgical therapy that can actually remove and replace a patient plus plasma. You can see here from this slide, what we do is we will remove the plasma out of the system and clean out of all the bad antibodies and put it back with replacement solution. So kind of somewhat similar to dialysis, but in this case, we will try to clean the antibody, the bad antibodies out of the body. So this was used for antibody immediate rejection and there's some certain side effects such as infusion related reactions. So again, we'll admit you to the hospital and monitor very closely. You may also experience some fatigue or dizziness, decrease blood pressure or increase the risk of infections and blood clotting problems. The other treatment type is IVIG, also known as intravenous immune globulin. 
So um, this kind of go hand in hand with plasmapheresis that I just talked about. So instead of removing the bad antibodies, IVIGs think about it as replacing you with the good antibodies through IV infusions. And again, this can also be used for antibody needed rejection and the dosings of IVIG varies depending on centers. This one also has the risk for infusion related side effects. So we would need frequent monitoring during hospital admission. There are some other side effects include fluid overload or kidney injury. So this may sound scary. And again, we will admit you to the hospital in the hospital setting and monitor very closely and act on early to manage the side effects if we need to. There are other medications that may be used. So this is a stronger medication I listed here, rituximab or rituxan, batazomib or valcade or eclizumab soliris. So this a stronger medication can be used for severe case of antibody mediated rejection and dosing really depending on centers can go anywhere from one to several doses. Can be given through IV infusions or subcutaneous injection. And it, uh, similar to medication that I mentioned earlier, may also bear the risk of infusion related side effects or increase the risk of infection. You may see this medication elsewhere since it can be used for treatment of other disease. So now that we talk about strong medication to suppress your immune system, so that unfortunately will also increase your infection risk. So please take some precautions after rejection treatment. We may have to start antibiotics to prevent infection. And again, this may be short term, similar to what you receive after initial transplant episode. Other precautions include wash your hand or use sanitizer often and try to keep your hand away from your mouth, nose or face. Also, you should avoid public places such as the shopping mall, especially when it's crowded. And for diet related um, precautions, wash and cook your food thoroughly and drink safer water. Because again, at this time, you will have higher risks of infection. So now that we talk about medications that can be used in a rejection episode, I do wanna talk more about maintenance immunosuppression, which will be medication can be given to you daily to reduce the risk of rejection and what might change in a rejection episode. So you can see here for change to immunosuppression over time really depend on multiple factors. And in any circumstance, um, the doctor would take the patient's entire treatment history into account. You can see here with lower dose of, um, in, in the case of infection side effects or cancer, we may um, decide to reduce the dose of immunosuppression. However, in rejection, episode, or if the patient has increased risk for rejection, we may have to increase or augment the immunosuppression regimen. Each transplant centers may approach rejection treatment differently. We can either increase the dose of anti-rejection medications or make change to a different medications or add another anti-rejection medication. So again, different ways that we can use to make it stronger or suppress your immune system further, but this will be something that the transplant team will do depending on patient specifics. Right now, there's limited data for new anti-rejection medication in the pipeline. So we will still use most of the immunosuppressions that have been developed and we have good experience with. So first of all, let's talk about tacrolimus, also known as Prograf or Inversus. This is a common medication that can be used to prevent or uh, rejection after transplant. This is an oral medication that can be given every 12 hours in immediate release tacrolimus Prograf, or it can also be used once daily, such as in Inversus tablet. It's important to point out that different forms of tacrolimus are not equal to each other. So please make sure to let the transplant team know which medications or which form of tacrolimus you're currently on. There are certain side effects associated with tacrolimus, include tremors or headache. This usually happens with higher dose or higher level of tacrolimus. So we will try to monitor very closely for your level. It can also increase your high blood pressure or increase blood sugar. So we will monitor closely and may need to add some medications. 
tackle, I must may cause kidney injury. And there was different types of this kidney injury related to tacrolimus, where there's acute reversible or chronic irreversible. Sometimes higher tacrolimus dose may cause more kidney injury. So again, we'll monitor and make change to the dosing as needed. Dose is based on blood level, and we try to target a certain level depending on the transplant organ, as well as how far away you are from transplant, as well as the potential side effects. So it's very important that on days of lab drawn, do not take tacrolimus until after you have your blood drawn, and the amount you change, take might change a lot. Certain medication and fruits such as grapefruit, starfruit, or pomegranate may affect medication level. So make sure to avoid those fruit and let the team know if you want to start any new medication or supplement so we can run through and see if there's any drug-drug interaction or any change to tacrolimus needed. The next medication to prevent rejection is mycophenolate, also known as Celsep or Mephortic. This is an oral medication that can be taken every 12 hours. This is important to point out that Celsep and Mephortic are not equal to each other. So again, please let the team know if what formulation you're currently on. Mycophenolate may increase the risk of miscarriage and birth defects. So all transplant patients of childbearing age potential will need to be counseled on this risk and we will start at appropriate birth control options. For side effects of mycophenolate, it can cause upset stomach, nausea, and diarrhea. So we recommend to take it with food to help alleviate some of the side effects. It may also cause slow blood counts. So the team will monitor this and make change as needed. Prednisone and steroids is the oral medications that I mentioned earlier. So the dose of steroid may start high after transplant and decrease over time, or in some case, may completely stop. Because of this risk for insomnia, as I mentioned earlier, so prednisone can be taken once daily in the morning. And for side effects with long-term and chronic use, sometimes may cause weight gain, high blood sugar and high blood pressure, as well as weaken your bone or delay wound healing. The last medications that can be used uh, for maintaining immunosuppression is Belatacep, also known as the brand name Neulogix. So this is an IV medication, and unlike the oral medications that I mentioned earlier, which will be taken on a daily basis, Belatacep can be given IV more frequently when you start and then monthly thereafter. This is well tolerated, but due to some potential side effects, we will need to assess for confusions or memory problems while on Belatacep therapy. I talk a lot about some side effects associated with immunosuppression and it's all about the balance between efficacy of medication and some potential side effects. So when I touch on what are some ways that you can do to help manage your side effects associated with your immunosuppression. So when do side effects happen? It can actually happen anytime after transplant, usually worse when the medication is first started. Side effects sometimes improve with time as you heal and also better tolerate the medication, but always discuss side effects with your medical team and never stop taking a medication without discussing with your provider. So that I mentioned earlier, just missing one or two dose of tacrolimus, for example, may significantly increase your risk of rejection. Your transplant team may suggest different options to help you manage side effects, such as trying another medications, using some non-medication options to address the side effects or discuss tolerance of the medication. Sometimes, again, suspected side effects could be a sign of infection or rejection. So make sure to talk to your transplant team if you feel something wrong. So now let's go into more detail about some common side effects that I may see when on immunosuppression. Tacrolimus may cause some headache. So the ways that you can help with this is taking acetaminophen or Tylenol over the counter. Make sure to pay attention to the max dose of Tylenol a day. Cold pack can also be used, but let the transplant team know if your headache get worsens or do not get better over time. Some patients may also um, mention tremor or hand shakiness when on tacrolimus, and this often related to the highest level of tacrolimus in your body, usually about an hour after taking the medication. So you can avoid activity requiring fine motor skill during this time and practice fine movement, but let the team know if this 
getting worsens or if it's really affect your daily activities that it make it difficult for you to eat or get dressed so that the team uh, will have appropriate actions for that. Mycophenolate, as I mentioned earlier, may cause upset stomach. So take medication with food to help alleviate some of that risk. Avoid taking laxative medications if you experience diarrhea or stomach upset. And call the transplant team now if you're unable to take anything by mouth or if you have a fever or multiple loose stools a day. Prednisone and tacrolimus may cause insomnia. This is often worse when taking high dose and may improve over time, but you can practice some sleep hygiene habits, such as going to bed around the same time every day, avoid watching TV right before bed time, or um, avoid caffeine after a certain amount of time. So this is some way that you can use to help manage your side effects, but again, talk to our transplant team if you have any concerns with your medication. There are certain medications that should be avoided in transplant patients, including herbal supplements, because sometimes it may hurt your kidney or hurt your liver, and it's not FDA regulated. So um, make sure to let the team know if you want to start any new supplement or new um, over-the-counter medication so we can run through, especially ingredient risks to see if there's any potential side effects or any uh, potential drug-drug interaction with your immunosuppression. Another class of medication to avoid is NSAID, also known as ibuprofen, Motrin, or naproxen, because this medication may increase the risk of kidney injury along with some other immunosuppression that you're already on and may also increase your bleeding risk. So please avoid herbal supplement and NSAID. So I hope that throughout this presentation, I talk about taking medication as instructed by the transplant team will help you reduce the risk of rejection. So I want to provide some tips that can help you to manage your medication. You can use a medication list to make sure that you can keep track of this, uh, of your medication that you are on and everyone on the transplant teams on the same page. You can also use pillbox to, um, to help you manage your medication and fill the pillbox quickly. So just by doing so, you will know when your medication is potentially running low and when you need to request refill or using auto refill. You should always carry the pillbox with you if you have to go outside so you can take medication around the same time every day. Let the transplant team know if you have any trouble obtaining medications because again, just missing one dose of immunosuppression may increase your rejection risk. Other tips include using some medication reminder, such as setting phone alarms on uh, or some phone apps that can set reminders for you. Some of the medications, for example, the tacrolimus or immunosuppression, ideally we want you to take it around the same time every day, a 12 hour apart, for example, with tacrolimus immediate release so that you have a constant drug level in your body and it's most effective. So it's important that you take it around the same time every day, make sure to not miss any dose of medication. So I know I went through several information today, but I hope that you have some take home points after this talk. First of all, transplant rejection is when the recipient's immune system start attack the transplant organ by recognizing it as a foreign object. We can do um, different treatment available depending on the type and severity of rejection. It's, um, chronic rejection is harder to treat, but the transplant team will try to catch it early as possible and provide you appropriate treatment uh, options. Medication plays a very important role after transplant to prevent rejection. So please be sure to take your medication around the same time every day. And as I said earlier, missing dose or stopping medication without talking to the provider may increase your risk of rejection. Please let your transplant team know if you ever feel ill, have fever, or if you feel like your transplanted organ does not seem to be working properly. So we can do certain tests to make sure that we catch, if there's any problem going on, we catch it early and we treat it early. Also let the transplant team know if you want to start any new medication or any new supplements, because as I mentioned earlier, certain medication may interact with your immunosuppression and may reduce the effectiveness of the medications. So let the transplant team know so we can take that into consideration and make change to the medication as needed. All right, so that will be all that I have for today. Thank you everyone for listening and I can take any question at this point. 
exciting. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful. Um, is my video not showing? It's showing now. I can see you. Oh, it is. Okay. Um, thank you. So there were a few questions and I, you've done a really wonderful job in addressing a lot of the questions that came in prior to the program, those who've registered and also, um, also in addressing some of the questions um, that have since come through, through and it was very um, specific and direct the information you shared that I hear from people all the time. One of the things I wanna point out that you mentioned that um, was in your myth slide is that the term rejection is very scary and mm -hmm. you know doesn't mean that your organ will fail. Um, mm -hmm. So hopefully that brings a little bit of comfort to people. Um, so I'm going to go through a few of the questions. Um, two of them are kind of similar. They just brought up other anti-rejection drugs or other drugs that may be utilized for um, post-transplant patients or in mm -hmm. post-transplant patients. So they had mentioned um, Rapamune, um, Everolimus, Dortress, or Imuran. Mm -hmm. um, what, what are your thoughts on those drugs or how they're used for transplant patients? Yep. Thank you for the question. So again, the question is to talk a little bit more about some other immunosuppression that I did not get a chance to talk about earlier today, including some of the um, mTOR inhibitors, Rolimus, Avrolimus, or some other medications such as azathioprine. All right. So um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of different medication that can be used, and it's different based on the transplant team's uh, different centers to decide which medication that the patient might be on. Um, so there's not really, um, you know, um, for medications, um, in this case, for example, the everolimus or acerolimus, um, there may share some similarity for some potential side effects. For example, it can also increase your blood pressure, uh, but other things um, include for side effects with mTOR inhibitor, I think about um, causing some increase in your lipid. So the team will try to monitor that very closely. We may need to add some medications to help with that as needed. Um, some um, aerolimus and aerolimus may also cause delay wound healing. So for example, if you have any upcoming surgery or any procedure, then the team may need to um, hold that or switch from serolimus to another immunosuppressions. But again, those are the are kind of like the main um, side effects of, of aerolimus or serolimus that I usually think about. The other medication that I didn't get the chance, oh, sorry. <laughs> No, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and the other medication that I didn't get the chance to touch on is azathioprine. Um, so this medications can also be used to uh, as a maintenance immunosuppression that you will take daily to, to reduce the risk of rejection. And for side effects associated with this, I also think about similar to mycophenolate, um, some stomach upset such as nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. So I would recommend to take it with meals or after meals to help with that. Um, it can also lower your blood count. So again, the team will monitor that and make sure that we balance between the benefits of treatment as well as some potential risks and make change to the medication as needed. So I hope that Great. answered the question. Thank you. Yeah, it was a very thorough answer, so thank you. Um, so someone had asked about anti-rejection medication and if they, if and how they might interfere with vaccine effectiveness, um, especially like the COVID vaccine. Right. Um, so that's a great question to talk about um, the any you know interaction potentially with immunosuppressions and anti and, and vaccines. So I think not that I know of that um, anti rejection may cause any um, any potential interactions. But again, thinking now that you're taking immunosuppression, so your immune system is kind of um, suppressed or weakened. Um, so sometimes the team, for example, may have to wait until you recover from a transplant episode. For example, wait until one month or six months after when your body become a little bit stronger to start giving you vaccine um, to kind of um, reduce the risk of some side effects or infections with, with that. 
but um, I don't think there's any potential interactions with immunosuppression in that sense. It's more about now that we've weakened your immune system, so we try to wait until you become more stable to give um, to give vaccines. So, for example, if you right now treat on under active treatment for rejection, we would not give any vaccine at that point. Okay. Um, someone had a question about other side effects such as toxicity to the brain or hair loss or extreme joint pain. Have they been um, side effects that you've been sort of informed about? Yep. Um, so question was asking about some other potential side effects such as um, uh, something, you know, toxicity to the brain. Um, so I think about that. Um, that might be a potential side effects for one of the class of medications for tacolimus or cyclosporin. We did see some report about that, uh, but the, again, the team will monitor that very closely. And in certain case, if the patient develops severe um, side effects from that, or for example, toxicity to the brain, then we may need to make change to the medication, for example, switch from tacolimus to another agent. Um, so I would say the risk is there, but we'll monitor closely. And if, um, if that's appear, then we may need to make change to the immunosuppression. But we think about preventing or reduce the risk of rejection is really the priority. Okay, thank you. Um, someone asked about side effects of CBD or Delta 8, 9, or 10 usage, which I'm not familiar with. <laughs> Yeah, so I think you're talking about the medical uh, marijuana and kind of potential interactions with some immunosuppression, if I understand the, uh, the questions right. So um, to talk about medical marijuana use in post-transplant patients, um, I think, first of all, I would want to say that we would want to avoid all the inhalation forms. So for example, if it's vaping, we want to avoid that because right now you are at higher risk for infection. So by doing, um, getting medical marijuana through vaping form, it can actually increase the risk of fungal infection. So certainly avoid that. Um, however, for medical marijuana through, for example, like an edible form that you would take by mouth, it can actually interact with um, the tacolimus medications or immunosuppression. So what we recommend is not necessarily avoid that, but we will have to be very clear with the transplant team of how much you're using, how frequently you're using, and try to be consistent as possible. That way we will take that into consideration when we look at tacolimus level and make change as needed. Uh, but I think that was just kind of approach from my practice so far, but please let the team know and talk to your transplant team about um, medical marijuana before using. Great, thank you. Um, so someone also asked about immunosuppressants and their potential effect on autoimmune diseases. Yep. Um, so like, I think the question was asking about immunosuppressions that, and the effects on autoimmune disease. So I think sometimes um, a lot of immunosuppression that we use to prevent rejection actually um, very similar to the medication that we use for certain autoimmune disease, uh, for example, like uh, lupus, um, but sometimes we may have to use different dosages. Um, so I think we share some immunosuppressions um, in that sense. But I think for a certain case, again, we're just really patient specific and knowing that the patient has some history of autoimmune disease, we may have to um, add more agents for immunosuppressions or um, we may choose a certain agents. But again, that will be something patient specific and we take that into consideration as sometimes autoimmune disease may affect the risk of rejection. Okay, thank you. Um, someone asked, uh, someone have ha has had an experience with their tax level fluctuating greatly and why a, a tax level might fluctuate so much. Great. So that's a great question um, to talk about the fluctuations of tacolimus. As I mentioned earlier, tacolimus level depends on multiple factors, such as um, the medications that you're on currently as well, um, in addition to tacolimus, and, and some other fruits that may also affect that. So for example, grapefruit, star fruit, or pomegranate. Um, so some certain diets may affect that as well. 
So I think for tagolimus level, we don't actually have a fixed dose for anyone. What we do is we check the level and we make sure to target a certain range depending on patient specific and center specific. Um, so the reason that tagolimus fluctuates so much may be related to other medication that you're on or maybe related to how the drugs act in the body. But um, that's kind of like another reason why the team will have to monitor your level and make change to um, your dosing. Usually I see more frequent dosing change early on after transplant, but hopefully after a couple months or a couple of years and the patient will come with a stable dose. But I would say avoid a certain fruits such as grapefruit, pomegranate, or star fruit, since those may increase tacolimus level. Okay, and someone asked earlier, I think I might have missed it um, in the question queue, um, if it's necessary, like how does eating with your medication versus eat, not eating with your medication maybe affect um, its effectiveness or the level? Right, certainly. That's a great question as well to talk about the effects of food or meals with your medication absorptions. Um, so I would say that Lots of these medications, um, I would recommend to take it with meals, and um, the exceptions will be the extended release version of tacolimus and versus, which should be taken on an empty stomach. What I ask is that you will try to be consistent, whether if you want to take it after meals, please do that around the same time, you know, every day. Uh, or if you prefer to take medication on an empty stomach, then you can do that, but just be consistent throughout. That way um, it will kind of stay the same effects with your absorptions of medications. And we can take that into consideration when look at tacolimus level and make change to tacolimus level as needed. Um, so I would say it's more important that you stay consistent with how, um, how you've been eating or how you've been taking your medication before or after meals, but a lot of the medication may cause some stomach upset. So I think it's preferred to take after, after meals with the exceptions for um, the extended release um, tacolimus and parses. Okay, thank you. So we have a few more questions. Um, okay. Is blood wash used for T cell rejection? I'm sorry, can you say that question again? I couldn't hear you. Sure. So Sorry, so the question is, is blood wash used for T cell rejection? Is blood wash um, used for T cell rejection? Um, so I think blood wash may be, um, if the patient may refer that to plasma phoresis, if I understand that correctly, mm -hmm. of like the procedure that I um, talked about earlier of how we remove the plasma um, out of your body and, and kind of clean, clean out of the antibodies from that standpoint. I think because of the different type of, of treatments for rejections, um, so plasmapheresis or plot wash in this case um, is more commonly used for um, antibody immediate re rejection because we can clean the antibodies out of, out of your system. However, for T cells rejection or acute cellular rejection, we would use other treatments, as I mentioned earlier, with the steroids or the thymoglobulin um, to kind of clean with the cells, like act on the cells versus the antibody um, throughout. But in certain cases with severe rejection, we may still have to consider um, adding on adjunct options, uh, for example, in that case with the plasma phoresis. So I would say typically I would see plasma phoresis used more for antibody immediate rejection, but again, it's patient specific and transplant center specific. Great, thank you. Um, are there any links um, between the anti-rejection medication and cancer? Yep, so questions about um, the you know, interactions between, um, or the association between immunosuppression and cancer. Um, that's certainly a risk um, that we have with all immunosuppressions actually, because what we do is we weaken your immune system. So unfortunately you are at higher risk for um, infections and in higher risk for cancer as well. So for all transplant patients, I believe we would try to have different protocol to, to kind of scan for cancers um, after transplant and kind of 
um, let the patients know about the potential risk. But again, it will all about the balance between the risk of rejection as well as the other risks for infections or cancer. But certainly for immunosuppression, it may increase the risk of cancer for exposed, for example, skin cancer. So I recommend all of, all of the transplant patients to um, avoid prolonged exposure to the sun or use sunscreen when you have to go outside. Yeah, thank you. And we actually have a program on our website that is by um, some uh, physicians from Penn on, from just dermatology who work specifically with transplant patients. And the program's on post-transplant skin cancer and you know how to avoid it and manage. So you guys can go to our website to find that program because it's really informative. Um, so we only have a few a uh, few more minutes for questions, so I'm going to try to go through a little quickly. So are there any indicators that one might have the cardiac allograft vasculopathy onset as a heart recipient? Right. Um, so the question is, see if there's any indicator for um, the, the CAV or chronic uh, vascular apathy. Uh, oh, sorry, chronic allograft vasculopathy. Um, so yeah, certainly for each type of rejection, we do have different um, risk factors that have been identified. Um, so for example, um, in some case, it may be related to your, in, your immune response, or if there's any um, like DSA or donor specific antibody that may present, in, um, may present in that case, which can increase the risk of rejection and certainly increase the risk of CAV. Other thing that have been identified for um, um, maybe like older age or male sex or obesity, which again, that will really kind of take into consideration for um, like patient specific from the recipient side and the donor side. But I think um, it may be related to the immune response as well as any um, existing donor specific antibody. Okay, thank you. Um, so someone asked, and I think a lot of people can relate to this. Um, Sometimes we forget or something happens and we miss a dosage or a medication right. um, or maybe don't take it exactly on time. Mm -hmm. um, like what would happen in the event like it happens? Right. <laughs> or what, you know, some people are like, should I double up on the next dose? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so talking about missed dose and what to do if you miss a dose. Um, so certainly I understand that sometimes life may happen uh, and you may miss a dose. So I usually talk about patients, um, talk to my patients about the rule of four. So if it's within four hours than your usual dosing time, then you can still go ahead and take your medication. For example, if you usually take your medication at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m., for some reason you oversleep that day and now it's 10 or 11 a.m. It's still within that four hour window. So you can still go ahead and take your medication. But if it's more than four hours than your usual time, then I would say to skip it and do not double the dose. So you would just go back to your normal dosing time. So that will only be in certain case or you know very rare case because just missing one dose of medications may increase your risk of rejection. So I think certainly for um, immunosuppression, the one that we care about the most uh, with like tacolimus or you know mycophenolate azathioprine that. Um, those medication, you can also call the transplant team and let them know that, hey, I, I skipped this medication today. Like, what should what should I do in that sense? Since it may be like patient specific, it may depend on your tacolimus level uh, or how far you are from from transplant, and you know what are the risks of rejection at that point to see what will be the best course. But again, if it's within four hours, then you can still go ahead and take your medication. But if it's more than four hour, I would just skip it and do not double the dose and let the transplant team know if you have any question or concerns about that. Thank you. Um, so I'm only going to ask maybe one or two more questions. Um, so someone asked, how does taking Esmer, oh, I'm so bad at it. <laughs> how does, I know you know what I'm saying. How does mm -hmm. that affect mycophenolate or TAC? Yep, so esomeprazole is a medication that can be used for um, GERD or, um, you know, like to prevent gastric ulcer. Um, so this is something that um, we usually, um, at our center, to, to kind of recommend that early on after transplant because you're on higher dose of, of corticosteroids, which may increase the risk of ulcer. So 
patients has been on, um, you know, this kind of medications and on TAG or mycophenolate, we have no problem with that. Um, I think for esomeprazole or um, other medications like omeprazole, pentoprazole within the same class, what I recommend is you can take it on an empty stomach. Um, that's why that's uh, the medication will work best in that case. But again, there will be no concerns with interactions uh, with your um, immunosuppression. Okay, thank you. Um, and then someone had asked about like this, and now this is not a nutrition discussion. We also have a nutrition program on our um, website, but someone had asked about like the types of protein and transplant medication. Mm -hmm. Like, is there in, like lean protein versus fattier proteins? Are there any in, um, effects of one or the other on medication? So the question was about whether there's any um, effects with um, protein, certain type of proteins on immunosuppression. And to be honest, I'm, I would say like that would be a great question to ask your dietitians. Um, since I think from, uh, you know, like from a medication absorption standpoint, I would say usually think more about like sometimes high fat meal may increase certain absorption of some medication, but I don't think protein or different type of protein have much of that effect. So I think from a diet standpoint, I would um, refer that question to the dietitians who may be able to give more recommendations on which will be the best type of protein or which the best type of diet that you can use after transplant. But from the drug-drug interaction standpoint or a medication standpoint, I don't see any difference with that. Um, and then last question for today, um, and which is a very interesting question, yeah. is changing your dosage regimen when you, like say you move and you're in a totally different mm -hmm. time zone. That's a very good question about whether you need to change um, medication dosing time which you have to move time zone. So certainly I think the idea would be um, ideal would be to have it 12 hours apart. but say if you have to move from one part of the country to another part, um, I think it's best that you feel um, kind of like a schedule that worked best for your for you. Um, so I think that will be something that you can talk to the transplant team to see um, if if that will be any concerns. I for me, I think like if it's within four hours and your usual dosing time, then that should be fine. And once you move that, um, then and then we can just kind of go back to ideally twelve hours apart, for example, with the tacolimus. Um, but again, that could also be a really interesting question to bring up to with your transplant team. Yeah, great. So that's all the time we have. It's almost exactly four. So perfect timing, the perfect amount of information as well as um, questions. And um, we did a wonderful job with this program. It was super thorough. You addressed like every question wow. people had pre um, planning, like the registration and everything was just perfect. So um, thank you so much. And um, again, as a reminder that this is meant to be general information and not um, intended to uh, prescribe your treatment. So please, please, if you have questions or want to make any changes, absolutely talk to your medical team before doing so. Um, we will send out the recording. I did send out the PDF of the presentation. Um, thanks again for everyone attending and thanks to our speaker. It was a really wonderful program. Um, any, any suggestions for future programs, please share them with us um, and hope everyone has a great week and go Phillies. If you're not from Philadelphia, you don't care about the Phillies, but we do because the World Series starts on Friday. Um, so thanks again for everyone attending and hopefully we'll see you at our next program.